Thank you, Martin. And a very good afternoon to all of you. So when Martin contacted me about this talk, I was a little perplexed as to what to do because I'm not a mathematician. I don't work on diseases. I have no clue about public health. So what on earth was I supposed to do here? And uh, I politely inquired Martin if he has written to the right as dot something. He said he had. So then I asked that, what is it that I can bring to the table? And then after going through the rest of the list, I figured out that most people talking over here will be mathematicians. And of course, mathematicians, you know, when they do modeling, they have a slightly different perspective about it. They go about the whole thing in a slightly different way. And people like me who deal with data and experimental data, as opposed to data that you gather from the field, people like us, we have a slightly different way of thinking about modeling, slightly different way of going about doing it. So I thought that why not present a story in which I can talk about how data experiments, manipulative experiments, and mathematical modeling go hand in hand, and how the mathematics gets constrained by the fact that end of the day, it has to agree with some kind of data. So in this context, the story that I'm going to talk about is about stabilizing biological populations. Now, stabilizing any unstable system is actually a rather venerable field in, bio in uh, mathematics. And in the context of chaos control, the field kind of begins with a seminal paper in 1990 by Ott, Gribogi, and Yorkie. And after that, there have been, I don't know, a few hundred, maybe a few thousand methods that have been proposed in the mathematics literature, applied mass literature, to produce stability in unstable systems. However, most of those methods assume that you have excellent knowledge about the equations that are governing the system. Most of them assume that you have access to the various parameters that are driving the system and so on. However, when you are dealing with a biological population, many of those assumptions don't hold. So for example, in most cases, we have extremely poor knowledge of the system. We have no clue what equations are there. In most of those cases, the system parameters, the equivalent of the growth rate, the equivalent of the carrying capacity, we do not have any direct access to those things. Typically, these are estimated a posteriori by fitting some model to the data. So real time, you don't have access to them. Most of the time, what we have in our hand are very short and noisy time series in which it's probably even meaningless to say, is this data chaotic or not? So it's very hard to distinguish whether the data is chaotic or not. So for example, the speaker in the morning was talking about estimating Lyapunov exponents from data. Sure, there are methods for it, but even the best methods need data sets which are at least a few hundred time points long, the kind of data that we don't have. And then of course, biological systems are inherently noisy. So what does it even mean to say that this particular data or particular time series is chaotic or not? So obviously these things have not escaped the notice of theoreticians. I mean, we have excellent theoretical biologists. And therefore, the way in which modeling these kind of systems happen is that the, it's the state variables which are typically perturbed, which basically means when you're talking about real biological populations, the perturbations are made at the level of the population size itself. And instead of focusing on things like, you know, Lyapunov exponents or different kinds of stability, people focus on ecologically relevant measures of stability. For example, if you have a time series 
is the amplitude of fluctuation in that time series high or low? So the idea is high amplitude of fluctuation is less stable, low amplitude of fluctuation is more stable. Or persistence, what is the probability of extinction of that population? If the uh, probability of extinction is high, we say that persistence stability is low and vice versa. So these are things which are more manageable for biologists because they have direct handle to these things experimentally. So the most promising candidate in this context was this method called pinning, which essentially says that every generation add a few number of individuals to the population, and thereby that is going to stabilize the dynamics of the population. So this was something that was proposed in 1995. However, in 2007, we did an experiment in which we tried to see if pinning stabilizes the dynamics of spatially structured populations, metapopulations or not, and the answer was a big no. So then we tried to figure out that why that was so, and it turned out that the reason was because this model that did not assume or did not account for the fact that many biological populations are extinction prone. And the moment you have subpopulations are going extinct, pinning kind of fails. Okay, so this was an experimental study, this one. So this was 2007. 2007 was when I joined ICER Pune. And at that point, this girl from Delhi University, she came to work with me. Uh, I was a young assistant professor then. So in I mean, in retrospect, if this person comes to me today, I would not have set her the problem that I set her that time. But at that point, the problem that I set her was something like this. Pinning doesn't work. So devise another method for stabilizing the dynamics of populations. It should be able to stabilize both spatially explicit and spatially homogeneous populations. It should be such that it should be implementable in a real population. It should be robust to things like noise and realistic extinction probabilities. It should be applicable in a biologically meaningful parameter range. So do this entire thing theoretically, and then do experiments and validate this stuff. As I said, I was very young at that time. So when you, know, you get this kind of a problem, you start by looking at the literature. And when we looked at the literature, the most promising candidate was this class of methods known as limiter controls, which simply says that there should be some thresholds and make sure that the population size doesn't go either above or below those threshold values. The problem is that how do you get to these threshold values? Okay, If you set a threshold value now, then if the environment changes, will the same threshold value be applicable? Most probably not. So how do you real time change the threshold value if you have a fixed threshold? So faced with this problem, we thought of the solution that why not make the control dependent on the population size itself. So in order to do that, we came up with this method called the adaptive limiter control. It, biologically speaking, I mean for those people who don't speak maths, the idea is that each generation, compare the size of the population with the previous generation, and don't allow the population size to fall below a fraction x or c of the previous generation. So if previous generation is 100, and if you have taken your c to be 0 0.3, make sure that the population is not below 30. And if it is below 30, make it 30. That's it. So this way, what happens is, what you have set is the fraction c. You haven't set the threshold. Now, obviously, in this particular case, if I set c equal to 1, then the population is going to be trivially stabilized to an equilibrium value. But we are not interested in this trivial stability. We are interested in much lower values of c. In order to do the simulations, we used the so-called exponential logistic model or the Ricker model. There are three major reasons for which we did so. One was that this is a very generic model which means that it does not have any species-specific parameters. More critically, this model can be analytically derived from first principles. And because we know what those first principles are, it can be shown that theoretically it is expected to 
actually explain the dynamics of a large class of organisms. And empirically too, this model has been used to model the dynamics of bacteria, fungi, insects, fishes, and amphibians. So that's a huge taxonomic range, right? So that's one reason for which we took this model. And then to quantify stability, we used something known as the fluctuation index. Again, if you don't look at the maths, so suppose I have time on x-axis, I have population size on y-axis, and let's say one of my time series is going like this, and another time series is, let's say, going like this. What we do is, for fluctuation index, we basically take these lengths, these lengths, sum them up, and then average them by how many time steps are there. Okay, so that's what that formula means. So obviously, higher the fluctuation index, lower is going to be the stability and vice versa. So we did that, and for persistence, we simply noted what is the frequency with which the populations are going extinct. In order to do our experiments, we used populations of Drosophila melanogaster. So this is what a population looked like. It was a single vial culture. We put the flies in them, and then we did whatever treatment, ALC treatment we had to do. And then each generation, we counted how many flies were there in this vial. Kept on doing this for 13 generations. Each generation noted down how many individuals were there. And we had eight replicate populations, three different values of control, zero control, and a, high, a low value and a high value. So this is what the data looked like. So control, and then these are the two values of ALC. So you can see that putting the ALC treatment reduces the fluctuation index. And this is the simulation from the corresponding Ricard model. This, what I'm showing you with arrows, are these values. So as you can see, in terms of catching the pattern, this model was reasonably successful. What about persistence? ALC turned out to have very nice effect on persistence. It actually reduced the extinction probability. Unfortunately, this was not statistically significant. So in a nutshell, this method was able to stabilize the dynamics of both specially structured and unstructured populations. But then, uh, sorry, this was about unstructured populations. We also worked on metapopulations. And essentially, we found that even for metapopulations, ALC was significantly able to reduce the metapopulation fluctuation index under high migration conditions, but not under low migration condition. Why is that so? That is because when you have low migration, uh, sorry, low migration, then the metapopulation is very stable to begin with. Therefore, although there is a reduction in fluctuation, that is not statistically significant. But in this case, the metapopulation is unstable to begin with, which is why you get a measurable reduction in terms of the fluctuation index. So it affect, enhances the constancy of unstable metapopulations, but does not affect the stable ones. In terms of metapopulation persistence, there was a statistically significant effect, 0.054. So essentially, it means that this particular method was able to stabilize both biological populations and, I mean, specially structured populations and specially unstructured populations. And since our empirical results were supported by a model which is not Drosophila specific, we expected this result to be likely broadly applicable. So this was the first control method that was empirically shown to work for a biological metapopulation. But then there are many other unanswered questions. What happens if you change the rate of migration? What happens, so we did it for a two-patch metapopulation. What happens if your metapopulation is larger in size? What happens if your carrying capacity is different, more or less? What happens if you have different extinction rates? Remember, in the first experiment that I showed you, it didn't work because there was extinction happening. So we simulated all these things. And the simple answer is that ALC works under all these conditions. Cool. So till this point, all we were doing were simulations. We had no clue about how mathematically ALC was working. And that is when these two gentlemen entered into the framework. 
So these, as you can see, both of them are mathematicians. And they ended up taking the method. And they mathematically, which means theorems, lemmas, propositions, etc., etc., using all those things, they ended up mathematically showing why is it that ALC is able to stabilize the populations. In the process, they ended up verifying a large number of things that we had shown using simulations. So basically, they gave the maths behind it. And over the next few years, these guys also ended up proposing other variants on the adaptive limiter you know, principle. So basically, if you look at ALC, it enhances both kinds of you know, stability. It works for both single populations and metapopulations. It's robust to many biological realities. And most critically, from our perspective, it has mathematical explanation for why it works. Together, this makes this method one of the most well-studied control algorithm in the entire population dynamics literature. But there's a million dollar question. And the million dollar question is, so what? It's one method. There are so many other methods, right? So how do I know that this method, just because it has been empirically verified, doesn't mean that this method is other, better than other methods, right? So how do I compare these methods? And the moment you get into a comparison, things become problematic. Why? Because people have actually proposed these various stability control methods in the context of different models, in the context of different kinds of stability. So some people have talked about chaos control. Some people have talked about you know, resilience. That's the favorite mathematician's definition of stability, and so on and so forth. So how do you bring all of them together under one framework? And if you individually take any control method, then you'll be able to see that for some value of the parameter, you can attain pretty much any kind of stability to any extent that you want. So the only way to compare across these various methods will be to A, fix a model and the corresponding parameter values where you are going to operate. For that, fix a particular level of stability and a particular kind of stability. For that, figure out the parameter values of each method for which that level of stability will be attained, and then compare the efficiencies of these methods using whatever indices that you can think of, and then integrate the performance of all these methods across multiple axes using some kind of index or indices, whatever. And then, only after you have done all these things, can you compare con the control methods directly using that index. Okay, seems like a lot of work. It was a lot of work. These two guys, again, you know, people when they're starting off in your lab, they are the best. So this guy was starting his PhD, this guy was starting his undergrad work. So they just happened to be there when this problem was coming up. So these two people took up the problem. So they took six different control methods. And I don't have time to go through you know, what these methods are doing. I'll just say one thing, that these three, uh, these four methods, they are one parameter methods, okay? They are either going to add or they are going to subtract. These two methods, these are two parameter methods. They are going to add or going to subtract based on some rules, okay? So that's the difference. So we did this comparison and came up with a very peculiar insight. The insight was that if there is a method which involves removal of individuals, then that method is going to be much better in terms of controlling extinctions than in terms of reducing fluctuations in population size. The converse is true if you have a method which only adds individuals to the you know, mix, to the population. Obviously, how much efficiency these methods have will depend upon the growth rates and the carrying capacities. And remember I talked about a composite index. If you do a composite index, then over four or five <coughs> different things, 
the restocking to a <coughs> fixed lower threshold turns out to be the optimal control method. Great, but then again, you have the same problem. There is no empirical verification. So we took these methods again. So this method had already been empirically verified. This we had done, four were remaining. We took these four methods and we again did experiments. The same kind of experiments where a single vial Drosophila population, <laughs> we censused it over 14 generations. So each generation, we would apply the control. We will see how many individuals are there. We'll note that number down and we'll propagate the population, do it over 14 generations, five replicate populations per treatment. And the things that we measured was this thing called fluctuation index, which is you know measuring how much, uh, what is the amplitude of the fluctuation, the probability of extinction. Since at some level, you are also thinking of these things in terms of their applicability, we explicitly looked at what we call the effort magnitude, basically how many individuals need to be perturbed, either put in or culled. And we looked at this thing, what is called the effective population size, which is the harmonic mean of the population size over time. So this quantity is very important because this tells you how much variation is there in the population. And in some sense, remember Kavita was talking about drift. So higher the effective population size, the lower is the effect of drift and vice versa. So the main thing over here, the main message is that if you have one parameter control methods, these methods cannot simultaneously attain all three kinds of stability. So when I say all three kinds, I mean this one, this one, and this one. This is called genetic stability, this is persistence, this is constancy. So one parameter methods cannot simultaneously attain all three kinds of stability, but they are economically cheap, reasonable. Whereas if you look at two parameter control methods, they can simultaneously attain all three kinds of stability, but the economic cost is going to be prohibitively high, which essentially means you have to do a lot of perturbation in order to attain whatever level of stability you are trying to attain. And of course, we did biologically realistic simulations, and our simulations matched our data, indicating that there was reasonable generalizability. But, okay, so this, till this point, whatever work we did, was done on populations whose dynamics looked roughly like this, two-point cycles, okay, high amplitude two-point cycles. But that's not the only kind of dynamics that insects have, right? There are many other kinds of dynamics possible. So will these control methods work for other kind of dynamics? And whenever you are doing any kind of perturbation, you are actually also affecting the biology of the population, right? So, how will the life history of these populations get affected by whatever control that you are doing? These were the two major questions that were remaining. But the problem was that if you have a simulation framework which is based on the Ricker model like we had, then these questions can't really be answered. Okay, because the Ricker model actually gives you pretty much one kind of dynamics, you know. I mean, you can get 2.4 point, 4 point, 8 point cycles and then chaos, but roughly speaking, it's overcompensatory dynamics up and down, up and down, there's nothing much else that it can do. So this needed to be answered in a completely different framework. And for that, we then went to a completely different way of looking at the dynamics of Rosophila populations. This is using an individual-based model. By the way, I forgot to add, if you have any questions, please, feel free to ask them then and there, okay? So, okay, now we are basically going into a different kind of work. So if there is anything till now, this is the best point to ask. I think, okay. So then, what we did over here is we looked at the interaction of life history traits with nutrition. Now, with nutrition to shape population dynamics and population stability. Now, in order to do this, we need to know a little bit about the biology of Drosophila. So in Drosophila, it's a holometabolous insect, which means that it starts its life as an egg, 
the egg becomes larva, the larva becomes pupa, and the pupa becomes an adult. Okay, four stages. Now, if you look at the dynamics of Drosophila in the lab, there are three major density dependent feedback loops that determine that dynamics. So, this is the biology eggs, larva, pupa, and adult. So, there is a larval density dependent larval mortality loop, which basically means that if there are too many larvae, then the amount of food runs out. Most of those larvae, they are going to die. So as the larval density increases, the larval mortality rate increases too. That is what is this arrow. Then the amount of food that the larva eats is what determines the size of the fly as an adult. The size of the fly as an adult in turn determines how many eggs it can lay. So if you have a situation where there are too many larvae and too little food, then the adults that are going to come out are going to have very few resources. They're going to be very small in size, as a result of which their fecundity, how many eggs they can lay, that will go down. So more number of larvae, less is the adult fecundity. That is this loop. And then there is a third thing that happens that is in terms of adult density. So if there are too many adults, then they tend to interfere with each other. And when they interfere with each other, the number of eggs that they can lay goes down. So that is what you have over here. Okay. So these three feedback loops together govern the dynamics of Drosophila populations in the lab. So this is what our model looked like, just the schematic of it, no equations. So you have the egg. A fixed fraction of that called hatchability hatches to become larvae. The larva then attains a body size. That body size is determined by how many larvae are there and how much of larval food is there. Once they have the body size, there is a critical minimum size. This is biology. Okay, The larva has to become a certain size so that it can become an adult. If the larva is less than that size, if it doesn't get enough food to attain that size, then the larva is going to die. So that is what is known as MC. So if the critical minimum size is not reached, the larva dies. If it is reached, then it becomes an adult. Once it becomes an adult, we figure out, I mean, we basically toss a coin and either make it a male or we make it a female. So that way we get total is the number of adults. Then these females, their size depends on how much food they have got over here. And their, the effect of adult density on female fecundity comes through this. Together, this gives us how many eggs are laid. And so we do this for every single female. And summed over all females, this is the total number of eggs in the next generation. Okay? So this is the way the model moves. So the major features of this model are is A, it is stage structured, it's individual based, it's a discrete generation model, and it incorporates several important life history traits like egg hatching, the critical mass, etc., etc., most of which are actually typical of many holometabolous insects. So remember, we are talking about the effect of life history and food, right? So all those parameters over here, these are the life history. Now we look at the food part. So we looked at two different things. We looked at larval food, juvenile food, and adult food. So in terms of larval food, you can just vary the amount of food that you are, get, you are giving them. And in terms of juvenile uh, adult food, you can modulate that by giving them yeast supplement or not giving them yeast supplement. So essentially, experimentally speaking, we created four regimes. A regime in which the larva gets lots of food and the adults get protein supplement. So this is high, high, it's called H. A regime in which larva gets lots of food but the adults don't get any yeast, HL. Low food to larva, yeast for adults, LH. Low food to larva, no yeast for adults, LL. Right? So these are the four experimental regimes that we created. And then, we ran an experiment. 
This was a 49 generation experiment. For each one of these food regimes, we had eight replicates. Again, the same protocol. Every generation, we counted how many flies are there in the vial. Kept on doing it for 49 generations. We got the time series. And then from these time series, we extracted the distribution of the population sizes, we extracted the fluctuation index, we looked at the autocorrelation coefficients, and so on. Now, this was for the experiments. Now, for parameterizing our model, you can see that this is a two by two matrix, right? What we did was, we took this data, and we took this data, and used this as, as a training data set in order to get the parameter values. And then, once we got our parameter values on these, then we looked at whether those parameters are working for these regimes or not. So essentially here the assumption is that they are combining linearly, which our luck was good, it worked out. So this is what the data looks like. So this is a box plot. And as you can see, the whites are the ones that we derived experimentally. And the gray ones are the ones that we got from our simulations. And as you can see, the box plots are very, very similar to each other. Now, this basically means that the population size distributions are very similar. Now, why are we so worried about the population size distribution? That is because in the previous paper, we had shown that the dynamics of a population can be explained almost entirely in terms of what is the population size distribution. Okay, so that is why it was very critical for us to show that the population size distributions are matching. And remember, I told you these are the training data sets, and these are the real one, the ones on which we, you know, looked at. Uh, what is it called? Well, test data set. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so this is for the population uh, size distribution, and this is for the fluctuation index. This is the training data set, this is the test data set. And as you can see, the model is capturing the dynamical features both qualitatively and quantitatively. This is rare, because if you have a Ricker kind of a model, you can at best hope to match the qualitative thing. It's very difficult to match it both qualitatively and quantitatively. So. Having done this, we knew that we had a model that works. Now, obviously, we can use this model to look at those other experiments which we cannot do physically. For Like what? So remember, we had all these life history parameters. So we wanted to see what will happen if we change the parameter values of these life history parameters. How will they affect fluctuation? We actually studied on all kinds of things. I'm just showing you the results for fluctuations. So these are the four life history parameters, hatchability, minimum critical size, sensitivity of adult fecundity to adult density, sensitivity of adult fecundity to adult body size. OK. As you can see, there is, there, there is huge difference between the quantitative differences and qualitative differences in terms of how the life history parameters are going to affect the dynamics in the four situations. I don't have time, I can't, can't go into the details, but the essential point I'm trying to show here is that the life history related parameters will differentially affect the population stability, and nutritional regimes will end up interacting with the life history. But does any of this really mean anything? I mean, these are after all simulation results, right? So one of the results that was very nice, very cute, was this result about the critical minimum size requirement. So if you look at this, what it says is that as the critical minimum size requirement will go up, the fluctuation index will go up, irrespective of which nutritional regime we are talking about, right? That's a clean result. Can we empirically check this? In order to empirically check this, we need different values of MC, right? Now, different values of MC are hard to get by, but it turned out that we had a situation where we could do it. So, in our lab, I mean, this is, I'm sorry, not my lab, this is Professor M. W. Shi's lab, we had a population 
which had been selected for faster adult development. And as a result of that selection, the MC, the critical minimum size required for pupation of these populations had gone down drastically. So these populations had been used to do an experiment and it had been shown, so these are the controls, these are the selected ones, it had been shown that the reducing the MC is going to reduce the fluctuation index, this is the LH regime, this is the HL regime. So what we did was, we took this data and we used this, ran the, our model on it, fit our model to it, and basically this is our model prediction. As you can see, we are getting excellent qualitative as well as quantitative match. That was in the context of fluctuation index, and this is in the context of population size distribution. Again, as you can see, the match is pretty good. So, of course, while we, we were doing all these studies, I know I always had the premonition that one day there will be a disease control mathematical modeling workshop which will invite me. So I, we had also ended up looking at a few other things. So we actually compared our model, the insights, whatever we are getting from it, with models from other species, like mosquitoes, like Daphnia, like fishes, and so on. And we ended up showing that there is a huge amount of overlap between, say, mosquitoes and our model. The insights that we are getting, there is a huge amount of overlap. If I look at Daphnia, the amount of overlap goes down, but there are still quite a few overlaps. And then as I go into vertebrate species, the amount of overlap in the insights between my model and this thing, it keeps on going down. But essentially, if you look at species like mosquitoes, then our model is actually going to be an excellent model for modeling the dynamics of such mosquitoes. We also looked at something known as sterile insect release technique. Uh, I think I, I, ICTS is one of the centers which is probably working with NCBS, or I don't know if it is happening right here at ICTS, where they are trying to release Wolbachia infected mosquitoes. Is anybody over here who knows that part? Okay, so that is a variant on this. So in this particular technique, what you do is you release a lot of sterile males into the population. And the idea is that these sterile males are going to compete with the normal males for matings. And of course, in all the cases where there is a mating with a sterile male, the female will not be able to lay any eggs. And over time, the mosquito numbers will come down. So what we ended up showing is that if you increase the amount of juvenile food, then there will be no effects on the efficiency of this process. When the density independent fecundity is low, but if you change the amount of juvenile food, then it can reduce sit efficiency when the density independent fecundity is high. So basically, whether your sit will work or not work will depend on A, how fecund the mosquitoes are, and B, how much their larvae are eating, okay, based on predictions from our model. So this is where we got it published. So what are the implications and what are the future questions? Number one, that the interactions between life history parameters to determine the dynamics can be very complex. And factors that increase juvenile survivorship will typically stabilize the dynamics. Factors that enhance adult fecundity will typically destabilize the dynamics. I mean, this in this one sentence over here is probably the crux of Drosophila population dynamics done over the last 35 years. You increase this one, population will stabilize. You increase this one, population will destabilize. Secondly, as I said, the core of our model should be applicable to the dynamics of other holometabolous insects. And already when I compare the insights from this model with other arthropods, the match is really good. And finally, this model can be used to see how controls, remember that's what we started with, how the controls will affect other kinds of dynamics. We have already done this work basically and the simple thing is it works. The control methods will still work with the other kinds of dynamics with some minor you know, variation here and there. 
But what we are right now really interested in is this question. What will happen evolutionarily due to the control methods? How will the different life history parameters be altered due to these various control methods? And what effect will that have on the future dynamics? How that will feed into the dynamics? So this is still work in progress. So Pratha was the person who started the adaptive limiter work. She did this while she was a master's student with me and then went on to do her PhD from Georgetown. Currently, she is uh, doing a postdoc at Yale. Shudipto is the person who did the work on the various control methods. So uh, Shudipto and Mishra together. And then Shudipto went on to do that uh, Gosapila model that I talked about. This is entirely his work. And uh, Professor Amitabh Joshi is the person with whom I did my PhD. So many of the ideas started while I was working with him. And we collaborate even today on some of these problems. So these are the funders. And uh, that's about it. Thank you. <laughs>